So uh, welcome everyone to uh, this UDO virtual conversation on the tree protection article of the UDO. Um, that is article 29, for those of you that haven't gotten into the, the full UDO yet. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> really quickly, we wanted to run through the meeting procedure. Um, just, it's important that today we submit all of our questions or comments in the chat function. Uh, which you will generally find at the bottom of the screen. Um, sometimes it, it may be in the top of your screen, um, but um, you can find the little chat bubble at the bottom. Um, open that up and submit comments or questions or at any time. Um, and I think maybe to start, we'll ask everybody who's in the meeting sort of as a, not really an icebreaker, but the opportunity to get into the chat, go down and find that chat function, uh, open it up and just, uh, submit your name, uh, as well as uh, the organization or neighborhood group or whoever it is you are sort of representing or where you live, um, just so we can kind of get a sense of who's in the meeting and uh, that you know where the chat function is. Go to the next slide. So as, as uh, responses are coming in there, just wanted to run through the purpose of the meeting today. We're going to be looking at one, uh, the policy foundation for our tree regulations. And we'll get into more of what we mean by that. Uh, secondly, uh, the key concepts of the tree protection article that have been incorporated into the UDO. And then answer any questions sort of from community members as we see, we wanna clarify sort of what's in the UDO uh, in this first draft. Next slide. Um, really quickly, we, we talk about this at every one of these virtual conversations. It's important to remember why we're doing this. Um, the UDO will be the primary regulatory tool uh, for the implementation of the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Um, the UDO is, is going to do um, a lot of things, but among them are uh, create more predictability for future developments so folks know what's in the development standards and, and what's um, allowed and entitled. Um, aligning development regulations so they work together. Um, simplifying terms, using more graphics are all sort of uh, goals of this UDO. Um, and then there's also uh, legal implications. We're trying to bring our ordinances into compliance um, or continue compliance with the 160D legislation uh, for North Carolina development rules. Go to the next slide. Uh, as, at a high level, uh, it's important to point out the UDO content. You will find the tree regulations, which we'll be talking about today, in the stormwater and natural resources sections, which is, um, you know, uh, one of the subsets of the UDO that you'll find in the ordinance. Um, next slide. Just wanted to highlight also some key dates for folks if you're not familiar with the UDO schedule. We are currently in the first draft of the UDO and our engagement period is going to run through January of 2022. Um, after that, we will have a second draft release as well as a council uh, public hearing draft that are open to public comment. Uh, will be subject to similar forms of public engagement. Um, and then ultimately, uh, Right now, the goal is to aim for a J July 2022 adoption of the UDO before City Council. Next slide. And so um, this is another one of our slides that we can continually come back to to talk about um, our development regulations uh, as being guided by adopted City Council policy. So the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan is our um, sort of large picture uh, policy for growth and development in Charlotte. And that was adopted in June of 2021. You can see that we've added a little stamp here um, for the Tree Canopy Action Plan. Um, just wanted to point out that the comprehensive plan uh, had a supplement, uh, a supplemental sort of stakeholder effort that we went through. It was a 12 month effort. Uh, we have some members of that stakeholder committee on this call today um, to explore uh, tree canopy policies um, in the tree canopy action plan. And so uh, you, you will see this stamped throughout the presentation today where we have a comprehensive plan policy that was guided by the tree canopy action plan. So just keep an eye out for that. It's 
just important to remember that we we uh, have gone through a, a long process of getting here today and um, try and call that out in the presentation. And then you go to the next slide. I think it's probably yours, Tim. And then with that, I'll hand it off to Tim Porter, our chief urban forester, who's going to present the rest of the slides and answer questions. Thanks, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you can hear me, somebody just give me a, a thumbs up on the OK, good deal. Um, welcome to EDO presentation and discussion on uh, tree protection article regulations proposed in the UDO. Uh, building on what Andrew just outlined for you as part of the tree canopy action plan, um, in addition to public engagement and um, discussion and providing recommendations for the comprehensive plan project. There was some analysis as part of that TCAP project as well. We built off of a recent tree canopy analysis that Tree Charlotte completed. We conducted some internal analysis, but this slide, you know, the image on the right shows pink, which is the current tree canopy circa 2018. And, and you start to see the orange, but there's some orange blobs on that image that represents decline. And this analysis looked at Charlotte's tree canopy, what changes occurred from 2012 to 2018, and our canopy declined 4%. It was at 49% in 2012, and 2018 it was at 45%. And that is approximately 10,000 acres of, of lost canopy. Most of that canopy loss occurred in residential areas, primarily in individual lot, kind of infill type um, locations. Of course, there was canopy loss all over the city and many different types of development, but um, sing, single lot, individual lot, infill types, so the, the greatest amount of tree canopy loss. But it did occur in all different types of patches and all different types of areas, including uh, public street right of way. And you know, so this, this bucket of data, the, the trends and analysis and results we obtained through the, through the analysis also supported the recommendations that came out of the TCAP effort. So just wanted to make sure that foundation um, was there for everyone. Uh, and on a high level approach, uh, the major concepts we looked at for proposing regulations for the tree protection article fell into these five key areas. We're looking to align, streamline, and simplify uh, the current tree ordinance into the new UDO, providing flexibility, uh, revise the big three, and that's the big three types of development requirements in, in the current tree ordinance. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, you know, we found a lot of interesting trends and results from our, our analysis on residential infill areas. So there's proposed regulations in that area, which is a step in a new direction. And just generally the administration of the, the tree protection article um, will evolve as well. So in the alignment uh, theme and the simplifying and the streamlining theme, um, we adjusted, we're proposing adjusted adjustment of current triggers. And these are um, you know, the thresholds that would require development customers to comply with development requirements, meaning a project would have to trigger one of these thresholds to um, you know, have tree ordinance or tree protection article requirements apply. So in the new article, we're moving away from specific triggers such as 10 or more parking spaces, there's also a, a facade change trigger. You know, we're proposing to eliminate both of those. Uh, we're moving towards a clear trigger applicability for new construction of principal structures, looking at BUA, built upon area, and additional building coverage, which is similar to what we're currently doing. And we're also you know, continuing and carrying forward um, tree ordinance or you know, tree canopy development requirements for single family significant subdivisions as well. It is important to note there at the bottom of that slide that residential development, uh, non-subdivision, these are the infill lots, the individual lots. Um, currently they are exempt from any tree ordinance development requirements, but uh, we're proposing that these lots and the type of development would trigger certain new requirements such as perimeter tree planting, and preservation of heritage trees, but they will not have to require uh, comply with tree safe. 
And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. So moving on to the big three, these are the three main focus areas uh, of the current and proposed uh, you know, tree canopy requirements, uh, perimeter trees, which are essentially street trees, trees on private property, uh, often termed internal trees, and green area. Right now it's called tree save, but we're proposing an evolution of that requirement uh, to a broader approach of, of green area uh, with more options. Tree save will still be there. It'll still be a very big part of the tree protection article, but there's going to be additional uh, options available uh, if a site qualifies. And so it made sense to kind of evolve that name into something more um, appropriate uh, for that kind of bucket of requirements. Key proposed changes. There's, you know, given we had a significant public engagement companion project to the comprehensive plan with TCAP, uh, you know, this is a significant update to the tree ordinance, and we're summarizing some of the very key areas right here on this slide. Uh, and we're going to start with heritage trees, um, and that is a requirement proposed to protect native species to North Carolina that are 30 inches or greater. And that's a, it's a big step that would apply to all heritage trees across the city, uh, not in the public right of way, not for city trees, but on private property, non right of way situations they'd be protected at all times. So that's a big step in a new direction. Um, another step in a new direction is requiring the planting of one tree for every 40 feet of road frontage for infill residential development. That regulation exists now for commercial development and for larger single family subdivisions. We're proposing uh, the same requirement for infill residential development. In the preservation, bucket. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're proposing tree save evolves and becomes the green area requirement. That menu of options ex is expanding. Um, and there's also multiple new extra credit incentive options, such as uh, preserving canopy on steep slopes, in stream areas, or in locations adjacent to existing tree save or you know, protected tree canopy areas. A uh, development customer would have the opportunity to qualify for extra credit, meaning their overall percentage, if they locate it in an incentive based area, would uh, go down from the standard percentage. Um, residential infill development would not be required to comply with tree save, excuse me, with green area requirements. Um, large subdivisions would continue to have to meet that, but individual lot development would not have to comply with tree save unless there was existing tree save on the property from a, a past subdivision project. There's also an option to donate land to the city's tree canopy preservation program to, to meet your green area requirement. We're also proposing to update the tree save payment in lieu formula. We're not changing the formula, you know, the variables or how it is calculated, but we are proposing to update the cap. There's a capped value built into that formula that's based on uh, county appraised tax values for land. Uh, and that capped value is extremely outdated. It's based on appraisal values um, from the early 2000s. So we're proposing to update that uh, to the most recent you know, uh, revaluation and current appraised tax values. Uh, another significant change would be increasing single family subdivision tree save percentage. The current is 10%, uh, proposing to increase that to 15%. That aligns with the current commercial tree save requirement, which is at 15%. And it also supports, um, you're taking a step towards uh, reducing the amount of canopy decline we're seeing in residential areas. Um, going back to that canopy analysis slide with the pink imagery that I started. with. So uh, digging in a little bit more uh, for internal trees. On the left, you see a council adopted comprehensive plan policy that supports uh, the heritage tree proposed regulation. Again, that's 
a regulation intended to preserve native trees to North Carolina, 30 inches or greater. Mitigation would be required if, if, those, if a heritage tree is allowed to be removed. Uh, there is some criteria that would qualify some trees to be removed. If it is a hazardous tree, if it's an emergency situation, then there's no permit needed. Uh, you know, public safety, you, you know, hazardous emergency threat to life and property. That certainly is something we need to be aware of and considerate of. And you know, property owners can, can remove hazardous, dangerous trees without a permit or mitigation required. However, what's proposed right now regarding heritage tree mitigation, um, for any tree that's proposed and authorized to be removed, that's not an emergency situation, there would be on the left there a mitigation fee component and a replanting component. So the starting point, what we proposed with this first iteration of the heritage tree requirement is a mitigation planting and mitigation fee uh, approach. And if you go to the example on the bottom there, a 45 inch native tree that's classified as a heritage tree, if it was authorized for removal as, as you move left to right, you'd have to pay $1,000 and plant one tree, or you could plant multiple trees, five trees in this case, to equal you know, the total diameter removed. So one tree for every 10 inches, you know, we'd round up 45 to 50, 50 divided by 10 inches, gets you five trees and uh, a $500 reduced fee. Um, we'd have to find a reasonable way to ensure those mitigation trees got planted. Uh, it may be difficult in some scenarios to plant all of them on the sending property, so to speak, the property where the heritage tree was removed. Um, but that would be a way for customers to reduce that overall mitigation fee. And you know, this is a significant step. This would not just apply in single family residential, this would apply across the city. It would apply in land development permitting scenarios and non-permitting scenarios. So if there was a situation where a property owner um, at an industrial site, for example, or a, a single family residence wanted to remove a heritage tree because um, for maintenance issues or just generally didn't like the tree, wanted to redo their home landscaping, uh, they would have to secure a permit before that tree was removed. And there is some criteria uh, that would allow that to happen. You know, there's some criteria criteria um, that says if the critical root zone of a heritage tree impacts uh, the buildable area or significantly reduces the access or use of a site, then there would be a process to submit that justification and have the tree authorized for removal. And moving on, focusing again on residential infill, uh, on the left of your screen, you see comprehensive plan policy support, trying to slow the loss of canopy on, in these areas. And again, going back to that first slide of mine with the pink imagery, we know that the majority of our canopy exists on these properties and also is declining on these properties. So we're also pro proposing a planting requirement. I touched on that earlier, kind of right here in the middle. Oh, let me go back, sorry there. Um, every 40 feet um, per lot uh, frontage would require a tree to be planted. I should say it requires a perimeter tree. Uh, the bottom bullet there clarifies that existing street trees in the public right of way or on, you know, in the front setback can qualify for this. So there has to be a tree there. If you have a tree in your front yard, that may qualify. So there may not be a planting requirement, but um, there has to be a perimeter tree in there for every 40 feet of lot frontage. And there's multiple ways to comply by planting or using existing trees. So um, let me talk over the slide for a second. On the left here is a residential area in 2014. You can see the aerial here. It may be small on your screen, but there's some individual uh, kind of standalone open grown trees here on the lots. Um, you can see here kind of the street view image 
There's a lot of those trees on private property. This one here may be in the right of way. It might be private property. In 2020, the aerial and the street view show that all the trees were cut down. This is an example of um, infill development. Uh, and there's no regulations right now in the tree canopy or the tree ordinance. So uh, some of the regulations proposed that I just talked about would um, require some of those trees to be preserved and there would have to be street trees planted uh, along the road frontage for those properties. The infill development again would not have to comply with tree safe unless it was previously existing from an older uh, initial subdivision project. And here's another example of uh, thinking more in terms about the new perimeter tree planting requirement. This is in third ward, 2012, um, some, you know, it's a vacant lot. There, there's two existing um, you know, older single family homes there. This is what the street view looked like in 2012. As you can see, there's one and there's two large um, mature trees that probably qualify as heritage trees today. But the point I'm really trying to make with this slide is Currently, you know, the redevelopment that occurred here brought in very urban dense residential, residential development. And you can see there's no perimeter trees there. There's no street tree requirement right now for the infill development. Um, and the tree protection article proposes that there would be, you know, in the future, a requirement to plant one tree every 40 feet. Okay, moving on to another and the last bucket of the big three. Tree save is being re-termed and evolving into green area. And this connects to multiple comprehensive plan policies, um, looking to increase the acreage of protected natural lands uh, within the city, improve the quality of the tree canopy. Uh, tree canopy coverage alone is not the greatest indicator uh, and the greatest objective and goal. You need to have the right type of canopy understory overstory uh, species arrangement. Uh, you know, the goal is to have the greatest volume of benefits available to the community. Um, there's another comprehensive plan policy objective to require tree preservation on all sites while also providing innovative and flexible mitigation measures for sites. Um, so we're trying to find the right balance. You know, I, that should have been another bulleted item on an earlier slide of the key themes of the proposed changes would be balance. Um, it's inherent in all those other themes I mentioned, but uh, we're trying to find the right balance environmentally, but also not to uh, overreach or you know, restrict too much economic development. Um, and the, the bottom public policy adopted by council in the, in the comprehensive plan in, in goal number seven would be uh, something that supports the heritage tree requirement. Uh, all that came out of the tree canopy action plan. As I mentioned earlier, one of the recommended and proposed new regulations is for single family subdivisions. This could be, you know, anywhere from five, seven, 10 to hundreds or thousands of new single family residences in a new subdivision. The current tree safe requirement is 10%, meaning a development customer would have to preserve 10% of existing tree canopy. We're proposing that uh, increases to 15% to help align with the current commercial site requirement and to help reduce the decline of tree canopy in residential areas. Um, this is a look at the ex expanded menu of green area options. Um, the items listed in orange are new. Um, if a site qualifies for this, there's multiple green roof options. Currently, the green roof option is never used. It's a little bit too restrictive, probably too cost prohibitive. We're evolving that into be much more basic to allow for multiple rooftop or terraced approaches with vegetation, not just trees. Uh, and the multipliers here indicate the value would be scaled based on soil depth. We're also proposing green walls as a component and option to meet the green area requirement. The amenitized tree safe area here on the bottom on the left, that was brought in in 2019, that's staying, that's um, a new approach to tree save. Um, 
that allows amenity use you know, in some level of impervious, some features such as benches, pathways, other you know, impervious type elements within tree safe areas in more urban dense locations. Um, we're also proposing to, uh, an overhaul of the offsite tree safe mitigation option. If you qualify, you can now continue with the current approach of donating land to meet this requirement to a conservation entity, or you can use tree save on a uh, other property and simply plat it and record it with deed restrictions and register that you know, with the, the Register of Deeds Office. Also proposing a donation of land option to the city's TCPP program. And moving on with the tree save um, expanded menu options is um, incentives and credits. If you preserve specimen trees, these would be trees that are um, higher value hardwoods or understory trees. Um, you get additional extra credit for that. At present, it's only it's one and a half times extra credit. In the future, we're proposing double extra credit. If you locate your tree save adjacent to existing tree save or existing protected canopy, you get one and a, one and a quarter times extra credit. Same thing with a, adjacent to a waterway. It's very common for tree save to be proposed and next to uh, streams. Um, that option, of course, continues, but you may be able to get additional extra credit now. And if you do it on steep slopes as well, which that currently doesn't exist, you get extra credit as well, uh, one and a quarter times. Um, so let me step back. I appreciate your time and your interest. And Andrew, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, lots of good questions. And uh, I think the first has to do uh, with tree save, green area, Came in from Doug Shoemaker. 15% um, subdivision tree save seems mathematically insufficient given tree loss trends. Cities analogous to Charlotte, and in parentheses, that, in parentheses it says San Antonio, require 35%. Why so little? Um, any thoughts you can add to that? I have a couple of thoughts, but I wanted to let you jump in first if you wanted to take that. Well, I think a lot of variables went into um, our assessment in view of what to do with that number. Um, and I'm very familiar with that San Antonio study. Uh, it's been something that you know came online on my radar this week. Uh, I'm looking to learn more about how they do it there to see if their tree save is applied the same way as ours. I'm not sure that it is, but I don't know enough. Um, so it, it's challenging, I, I think, to increase that current percentage from, from 10 to something higher, um, just with all the other variables, you know, political um, components, you know, th there may be some, you know, development industry pushback on that. Um, I, I think, you know, we could definitely look at making a more strategic move to connect tree safe percentage to um, adopted canopy goals. Uh, and we did do some of that work during TCAP. I think we can improve upon that. And it's something we're going to look at in the future. You know, soon after the UDO, we're looking to take on an update to the 50 by 50 goal in the Urban Forest Master Plan that will likely look at some really tough decisions in determining what type of coverage goals we want. Um, are we going to keep 50 by 50? And at that point, it'll be critical for us to, to really look at, in a much more strategic, direct way, tying our development regulations to the higher level policy goals. So there's an opportunity to increase our connection there. Uh, I think we took some strides recently during this initiative, but something we could always improve upon in the future. Good answer. Um, yeah, jump in on that. No, well, that was good. Um, we had a couple here from uh, Joe Padilla. Um, the first question is about heritage trees. Um, and I think the answer has to do with sort of available data, but um, has the city done a survey of roughly how many heritage trees exist on private property or a case study showing how the heritage tree mitigation requirements would impact housing costs on a particular project? Um, before I hand it off to you, I will say that I think there is, there is some analysis being done. I don't, 
I don't know to what extent the tree regulations are included. I would have to rely on others on the call to maybe talk about that, but there are some economic analysis or uh, sort of um, different studies going on right now to uh, gauge the financial impact to the cost of uh, different types of projects. Um, I'm not plugged into that. I just know that that is going on. So, um, but I'll hand it off to Tim to talk about maybe tree data and what we have available and how we analyze uh, tree canopy in Charlotte, um, just in general. Sure, um, appreciate the question, Joe. Um, and I'd have to, you know, talk to some other colleagues in planning to get you definitive information on the, the current analysis, economic analysis that's going on. I'm not sure how much of the tree canopy regulations are, are part of that. Um, during the TCAP, we did conduct, conduct some analysis on infill, single family or single lot uh, canopy loss. Um, we did not drill down to the um, tree level uh, to get good estimates on the volume of trees. Uh, I can tell you I'm currently looking at available uh, forest inventory data available across the country. Uh, we're also considering possibly additional analysis uh, starting next year during the public engagement process for the UDO to see if we can get a better sense of uh, you know, a very general estimate of the quantity of, of potential heritage trees out there. Uh, but as of right now, we don't have definitive data on that and we don't have specific scenarios that we've run on a large scale to see how that would um, play out, um, you know, on a parcel level or a project level. Um, then the next question is about the survey for rezoning and um, the question is, why is the city requiring a tree survey prior to rezoning? This is costly and time consuming process that should be reserved for land development process after rezoning has been approved. Uh, I did drop in an answer into the chat that essentially our tree ordinance today does require uh, a tree survey for rezoning. So that's a carryover requirement. However, we have updated it. I know we, uh, we worked with uh, Mara, who's head of entitlement services here at planning to uh, update that requirement to really only require the types of trees that you would be able to, or that you would be thinking about um, in the rezoning phase of the project. We're not really requiring if, for you to sort of plan out where your green area or your tree save is going to be for that development project. We're only re requiring that survey to um, uh, include the trees that are protected. So that city perimeter trees, uh, now heritage trees and uh, trees that are sort of subject to an approved development plan um, or protected by a development plan. So um, we think we've updated that to have it make a little bit more sense um, and hopefully that um, that helps with that. Yeah, I would add, add a little bit to that is um, there's no intent to have a site-wide inventory of all trees. Um, as Andrew said, right now in, in the future, uh, the perspective would be to identify any protected trees uh, with, a, with an emphasis on street trees, of course, and heritage trees. Um, yeah. But again, not a site-wide inventory. I have, I have heard comments on that where every tree on the site would have to be part of an inventory. That's that is not the case. We're certainly not saying there's no cost impacts or you know or changes to how project management may occur. Um, you know, heritage tree identification for survey work would definitely uh, be a change, um, and we're aware of that. We acknowledge that. Um, next question is about uh, tracks managed for forestry. Um, you want to talk about that, Tim? How we deal with forestry operations? That's a good one, and I may, I may have to kick that over to Henry Kunzig if he's on the call. Henry, um, you'd be a little bit more uh, aware of how to answer that appropriately. Could you jump on and yeah. share some thoughts? Yeah, so historically traditional forestry has been exempt from a lot of these requirements. Um, there are provisions that sites must have approved forest management plans and they must operate under the forest practice guidelines through the North Carolina Forest Service. So those sites are regulated based on state level regulations. So we've exempt or we have exempted those sites as long as they're 
doing traditional forestry and it's part of a forestry program, we have not regulated those. There is some language, and I believe one of the other development regulations about time frame between when a forestry activity takes place and when a development activity can take place. So there has to be some separation between when a forest plan was done and when it turns into a development project. And I will add that we did put a more express exemption um, in the applicability article or the applicability section of the article. So it's 29.2 um, item B3. Um, and you'll see uh, active, there's a call out there for activity um, undertaken for timber and forestry. Um, so if you have questions or want, want to explore that, that's where I would look, uh, section 29.2. And thank you, Henry and Andrew, for that. As if you didn't know, Henry used to work for the state as a forester. So that's why I pass it over to him, because he knows that stuff much better than me. We're not proposing anything to regulate for that type of you know, forest management work. Um, the next question is uh, from Laura Hinton. She said she loves the heritage tree preservation, but thinks it will become an issue um, on some sites. There are more are there more guidelines on when removal will be allowed uh, based on a site layout or is this a case by case basis? So um, it's a great question and we fully acknowledge that this is a, it's a big step forward. Uh, and we think it's supported by comprehensive plan policy and canopy decline trends and data that we have. Um, this is our first attempt and iteration of it. So there, this is in my mind, probably the, the area we need where we valued feedback the most. So uh, there is additional guidelines available. Uh, on the UDO website, there is a, a supplemental document page that has a proposed guideline that has much more detail explaining the regulatory approach for heritage trees. Uh, something that'll be a, a big component of that as currently proposed would be the critical root zone of a heritage tree. Uh, we're proposing that in all cases, that can be disturbed up to 50%. Um, so the, the critical root zone will essentially be this circular zone around the trunk of a tree on the ground. And of course, you know, a few feet into the ground. Um, it's one foot for every inch diameter of the tree. So a 30 foot heritage tree would have a 30 foot critical root zone. So you could disturb 50% of that root zone uh, up to within 10 feet of the trunk. Now there would be some allowances for existing site constraints such as foundations or other structures. If a tree is grown with a foundation you know, on four feet, within four feet of the trunk on one side, that would be something we would take into consideration. And of course, you know, th that would be authorized as far as a disturbance um, offset that could, be, that could occur within 10 feet. But again, 50% of that critical root zone could be disturbed. And as far as buildable area, there is a guideline that proposes um, if 50% or more of the buildable area is impacted by the critical root zones of heritage trees, then, then heritage trees may be removed. And again, remember, there's you can disturb up to 50% anyway with a heritage tree, but even with that 50% disturbance allowance, if the root zone, the critical root zone impacts more than 50% of the buildable area, those trees can be removed. And of course, any emergency hazardous, dangerous tree can be removed at any time. Um, but I, I do recommend that, that guideline on the UDO website, and maybe we can put a, a link in the chat so people can go check it out. It, it's quite a long guideline. Uh, uh, there's, we do acknowledge that this is a big step and there's a lot of case by case scenarios that may come in that are challenging and uh, we'd, we'd have to look at that. But again, we, we want to have as much feedback from all perspectives, you know, development industry, property owners, you know, environmental advocates to, to get a better sense of how this fits for Charlotte, uh, because we want to make sure we're achieving city council's goal, but also that it's something the community is okay with and wants. And so again, we really appreciate feedback in that area. Thanks. Um, the next is about uh, from Gary Spellman. Will the city accept deeds to 
all parcels restricted for tree canopy? Would this include parcels with ponds and dams? Um, I assume that question is about tree save or green area. Um, and will we accept that as sort of um, if a tree save area has a pond, will we accept that? Um, Gary, if that's not exactly what your question is asking, feel free to re-enter it. But um, Tim or Henry, you want to take that? Is that an issue in tree save? I didn't quite hear the first part of your statement, Andrew. Was the question, would ponds yeah. be allowed in tree save areas? Right. So it, will, it says, will the city accept deeds all parcels restricted for tree canopy? So um, would this include parcels with ponds and dams? Does that make sense? I think so. Um, we may need to follow up offline to make sure we fully understand that. Uh, but right now, um, ponds um, can't, you know, don't qualify to be included in tree save areas. And Henry, I may ask you, since you know, your team manages this every day, I don't know for certain what, as far as calculating tree save, if ponds are something that's an allowance that you can kind of carve out of that calculation. Henry, does that make sense? Yes, for single family residential projects, um, we do allow the removal of ponds from the overall calculations as long as the ponds remain. So that reduces the amount of area that the tree save numbers are based on. But as far as actually including a pond in the tree save, we generally, we, I don't know of a situation where that's been permitted. Thank you. I think there could be extra credit opportunities if tree saves located directly adjacent to a pond. If there's some water quality or stormwater management benefits there, we'd have to look at that um, related to the stream side kind of incentive. Um, and you know, definitely appreciate any thoughts and feedback on how ponds and other structures like that um, or items like that are looked at um, as far as calculated tree save, because it, it does differ now uh, between residential and commercial projects in the tree ordinance. Good stuff. Um, next question is from Doug. And Doug, I was typing out a long response and I thought, you know what, we'll just wait. I think it's easier just to answer this in, uh, over the uh, conversation. But the, the question is about uh, mitigation. And he says the mitigation formula allows trees to be removed from where they are growing naturally to somewhere else at a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, planted trees take decades to equal the value of existing. When we mitigate wetlands, uh, and he goes into a big long explanation of the one, uh, sort of the value of uh, constructed wetlands versus natural wetlands. Um, why is the tree formula not one to four? If it's too easy to mitigate, the forest will become scarce where people are and move out to the periphery of the city. Um, he suggests using a multiplier of at least three or four. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that, the, and I assume this is talking about offsite mitigation. Um, if that's not the case, Doug, uh, feel free to clarify. But the, the offsite mitigation option is, it only applies sort of at a one for one. So you can save areas offsite uh, for green area um, at a one to one rate in our tier one sites. So tier one sites are really only going to include our most uh, sort of dense regional activity centers, uh, community activity centers, which is kind of the next tier down. There you go, perfect. Um, and then campuses, if you're zoned IC2, which is your high intensity campuses, uh, think, uh, you know, for example, uh, some of your uh, campuses closer to uptown. So th those aren't going to necessarily be, um, so, so one, this is a sort of a, a requirement or an allowance that we allow to day uh, that was updated as part of the 2019 update, um, but it's also not a huge uh, geographic area of the city. Um, and uh, if you are in a tier two site, it would, it would uh, apply at a sort of the multiplier is I think 0.67, which is about 150% um, increase in the sort of area. So there, there is sort of a, a tiered approach to that that we're incorporating to the offsite mitigation. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about anything else in the offsite mitigation, Tim, but if, if you feel like you want to add to anything I said, go ahead. Um, 
no, I think that's good. Um, uh, as far as the payment in lieu option, um, we decided not to really mess with that and change it. Um, we felt that that was a heavier, heavier lift to transition to a different payment in lieu approach. Uh, our goal was to update the formula to utilize current land values. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not, it's not an even one for one, you know, it's a land area component. So um, there may be more trees removed that are offset by um, an offsite tree safe area, or you know, when the city takes a payment in lieu fee and we go buy land, it's not always a one-to-one -one scenario. Although I will say TCPP, the city's conservation program um, has acquired, uh, I'm not sure where it is right now, but recently it was more than double the amount of land that development customers you know, paid their way out of preserving. Um, so I think the preservation balance is likely higher than what developers would have had to have saved on their site. We're digging down in the weeds here. However, I will say one of the challenges we've had is that we don't always have success acquiring land in close proximity to where those payment and loop fees are, are coming out of. Um, so that's something we're hoping to take on um, and make it a little bit easier for development customers to achieve during permitting, but also when we do collect fees um, for payment in lieu for tree save that the TCPP program um, through the Ur Urban Arboretum Trail initiative can go in to those more urban dense areas to protect tree canopy in a more targeted approach because we're losing canopy in areas that's difficult to acquire preservation land on. Mm -hmm. And I'll also add the offsite mitigation uh, sort of option. We've, we've added something in there to take care of what you are talking about, Doug, where, you know, if, in theory, if you're, you know, removing trees on your development site and you're saving them offsite, there's today, it's a, I think we say that, it, that distance between the receiving site and the development site has to be reasonable. But we're putting more definition to that in, in the guidelines, and you'll find that in that supporting documents. Um, sort of page that there's sort of a, a locational requirement to that as well, that it has to be within a half mile. I think we're looking at what's a reasonable distance. Uh, we're still exploring that. So um, we'd be interested to hear from the community what, what everyone thinks is a sort of a reasonable distance of uh, that receiving site being located within a mile, two miles, you know, so that it's not sort of uh, trees are being moved to places where people aren't sort of living. Yeah, in, in general, um, but, in general, I wanted to say real quick that I, I do feel there is a sense of urgency to, as quick as we can, tie our regulatory, our, our operational, and kind of our community program goals to the higher level canopy objectives that we may have. And we know canopy is declining. We know the time is now. Um, we have the comprehensive plan in place now. That's a huge part of the, the puzzle. Uh, and there's some canopy goals set in the place type uh, guidance within that plan. But we also need the, the update of the urban forest master plan to really give us that full piece of the puzzle on the, on the highest of levels. Um, and what I see in the future is once we have that in place that we really need to take another hard look at possibly adjusting. You know, I'm not, I don't know exactly what's gonna happen going forward with UDO but you know, we may have to take another look at changing tree canopy regulations to better connect some of those regulations to the high level strategic goals, especially if 50 by 50, our current canopy goal changes and becomes, for example, more strategic and intentional on neighborhood scales, then we may have to adjust, or it makes sense to maybe look at um, you know, our canopy regulations to better connect to those higher level goals. All right, I'll stop now. Take some more questions. That was good. It's a good point to bring up. Um, the next one's from Eric Zaverl. Uh, could, could you explain some more about the triggers on heritage trees on private property, uh, including the critical root zone triggers? So for example, how would any existing situations be handled? Would it 
be at the time of building permitting for a redevelopment or remodel of hers, uh, would residents be fined for conditions that have been present for years, decades on private property? Um, okay, good yeah. question. So let me answer that last one first. No, no, there would not be any fine or retroactive, you know, regulatory strategy to go after a property to fix something like that. Um, the regulatory approach would be once, let's say it is adopted by council in its current proposed format, at the moment of implementation, all heritage trees, any tree that qualifies as a heritage tree within the city limits would at that point be protected. Um, it's not a, for example, right now, there is a heritage tree component in our current tree ordinance that says in, only in single family subdivision developments that are subject to the tree ordinance. If you have a heritage tree, you're supposed to preserve it. That's a permitting only triggered situation. And um, the new heritage tree approach takes a big step away from that. We're pivoting right now to, to say in the current pro proposed format that at time of implementation, any heritage tree would be protected at all times. So it would not be a permitting, land development permitting triggered scenario only. So if for example, if um, a home that was built in the 80s and uh, there's, there's massive large trees out there, some of them are heritage trees. If a property owner wanted to cut one of those trees down because they wanted to install a vegetable garden, you know, that's not gonna require any land development permitting. However, there would have to be a, a separate permitting process, a kind of standard permitting process to uh, achieve, uh, obtain authority and an authorization from the city to, to remove that tree. Um, so in reality, there's gonna be, as proposed, two separate processes. Uh, we'd see a lot of this in the land development permitting process. And then we would see a lot through kind of the, the offline non-land development permitting process. And any future, you know, any future infill development that, were, that occurs with a uh, as I said earlier, if a heritage tree grew for decades really close to an existing home and that, that home foundation was in four feet of, of that tree, well, then we know um, that the root zone, the critical root zone of that tree does not extend 30 feet under the house. We know, I mean, of course, trees sometimes, you know, roots sometimes impact foundations, but we know that that root zone, uh, we would allow that root zone to be considered as, let's say it's four feet off the house, that the future development could come in within you know, four feet of that tree because the previous site conditions restricted that root growth to four feet on one side. Hopefully that made sense. I think it makes sense. Um, the, so I just wanted to note, we're, we have about four minutes left until we're at the hour and we wanna be respectful of folks' time. So um, we're gonna stick around and try and take questions um, on one by one. However, we understand that if you have to jump off, um, the session will be recorded so you can come back and watch uh, if there are any sort of like questions that you wanted to, to hear about, but we'll, we'll stick around and try and take on the questions that are, have been submitted so far. Um, uh, the next question that I see here is about uh, fee and lieu costs. Um, could, could you run us through, and I don't think Doug is on the call anymore, but uh, maybe could you run through a typical case so we can understand if the fee would be any barrier to just taking trees out and passing the cost to the buyer. Uh, we're going to talk about fee and lieu and the adjustment there. Okay. Um, so right now the, the fee and lieu option is only allowed and available for commercial development. So that would include you know, gas stations, office buildings, uh, industrial, uh, multifamily, townhomes, uh, even though that's residential, the, the tree ordinance considers that commercial. And um, that's only available in certain scenarios. So um, very urban dense locations, transit locations, uptown centers, things like that. But right now that formula, if you qualify to use it, 
you take your land acreage that you're developing multiplied by the county appraised tax value. Now, if, if your appraised tax value hits the, the cap, you know, there's a, there's a cap that we have. And right now it's $80,100. So if your per acre value exceeds that, you revert to the cap. So you would multiply your acreage times your land value, most cases hit the cap. So that's, you know, times 80,100. And then you multiply times the, the standard ordinance multiplier of 15%. So if you don't have any options, and you don't qualify for payment in lieu, you have to preserve 15% of your site as tree saved. That 15% uh, number carries forward to the payment in lieu or fee in lieu option. Um, in some scenarios, you actually have to do 150% of that standard multiplier. So the 15% uh, increases to 22.5% because that's 150% of 15%. This is extremely complicated. So you multiply, there's those three variables, your site acreage times your land value, which is often 80,100 times your multiplier, which is typically 15% or 22.5%. And that formula calculates the fee and your fee is spit out at the end. For example, one acre, one acre times 80,100 times 15% is a $12,000 fee. You know, I'm rounding down. It's like $12,000, $12,015. So that's the current um, fee for, for one acre of a development site. Um, in the future, the current cap would increase. So we're proposed just to change the capped value from the 80,100, which is based on appraisal values that date back before 2010. I think they're mid-decade, 2005, six, something like that. We're just proposing to use the current valuation numbers, which I think may have been 2019, 2018. So that capped value increases to about $192,000. So generally, if you take one acre, multiply that by $192,000 times 15%, you know, that $12,000 fee for one acre development would increase to about $29,000. And development customers, if they qualify for that option, can use it in combination with other tree safe options, other green area options going forward. So just some kind of foundational knowledge for payment. I hope that kind of got to the gist of that question, Andrew, but did I miss anything? No, that's good. I think it, it, it kind of demonstrates that it is kind of complicated and we don't, that's why we don't really go into the details, but it is good to get sort of a, the, the numbers out there. So thanks for doing that. There's, there's um, also a guideline proposed. So go back to that same supplemental webpage. There's a guideline that explains everything I just said in probably better detail and more eloquently than I just spoke. Yep. Uh, so there was a question about greenways. It looks like Henry took that one on uh, pretty well. So greenways are allowed to be uh, overlap with tree save. Um, and the last one that I think we'll take on just to be respectful of people's times is, is from Kevin McCorkle. Uh, how will the city, and it's a good question, how will the city police the removal of heritage trees by single family homeowners or instances where no other permit is required? Uh, how will the general public outside of the development community be educated on the requirement of a permit? required for removing a 30 uh, inch heritage tree? It's a great question, Kevin. Um, if that's adopted in its current form or a similar form for heritage trees, um, we, we intend, we'd have to develop this, but the intent is to have a public, you know, marketing campaign to get the word out to, you know, certainly um, there's, there's a type of development customer in that world that we currently don't come across very often. So we'd have to uh, market and engage and contact the other development um, groups that we currently don't see. We'd have to have a broad based, you know, just public campaign to let property known, owners know that you may have a heritage tree now and there's some protection on that. Um, it's similar in concept to 
how the city arborist group currently regulates city trees. You know, so the city arborist group, which is part of the city's landscape management division in the general services department. You know, Lori Reed is a city arborist and her group protects and regulates those trees outside of land development scenarios. Um, those trees are protected at all times and they have their own separate process where they have inspectors that go out, um, look at service requests, and then they respond to customers and contractors who ask for you know, permits or ask to cut down trees or to trim trees. Um, they also stop when they see some unauthorized work happening. Um, so very much we'd have to create our own permit group to do that. And that's something we'd have to dig into and start planning for at some point, if the heritage tree regulation is adopted, it'd have to be a whole new team of staff in the land development um, world for the city of the Charlotte Development Center. We'd have to have a team to adequately enforce that, um, but also um, educate and engage because they go hand in hand. Um, you know, to have a balanced approach, we need that awareness to go up. It's a big, it's a big step, you know. It's a big step in a new world, um, not just land development, but also that individual property owner. So, it'd be a heavy lift, but we have to put some resources into that, short term and long term. We haven't, Thanks, we haven't really developed any type of budget plan or anything for that. You know, we want to make sure we we kind of check the box on the proposed regu regulatory side of things before we get into any budget planning. Um, we wanna make sure that we have the regulations where they need to be before we look at providing and planning for resources on a serious level to enforce the regulations. Yeah. So that was the last question that we have in the chat. Um, I think at this point, since we're over uh, the one o'clock mark, um, if, if there are other questions or comments that you have, feel free to reach out or come back for our six o'clock session tonight. We have one, uh, same session going on at six o'clock tonight. If you want to, um, engage with us then, uh, you can also visit publicinput.com slash Charlotte UDO. And, and that's kind of going to be our engagement platform where you can download the tree article. You can, uh, submit comments. Um, we're giving any comments or questions submitted there at first priority. So, if you have a comment or a thought about anything that we presented today, uh, that's the best place to go um, for uh, to submit those comments. Um, so with that, I will just uh, say thank you. Uh, we appreciate all the great questions and feedback, and uh, we look forward to continuing to engage with everybody uh, throughout the rest of this public engagement process. Thanks for your time, and thanks for your interest.